point of personal privilege to note that both of our nominees are immigrants to this country. I point that out not because it is the exception, but the achievements of the immigrant population to America have made us what we are today. It is more likely the norm than the exception, and these two nominees uh, certainly fill that uh, description. I'm going to start with Ms. Rickleman. You have, we have five-minute rounds. You have litigated a number of cases across the country, probably none more celebrated or spoken of than the role as lead litigator in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, in which you argued that the Supreme Court should find that a Mississippi law banning abortion after 15 weeks is unconstitutional. In addition, you argued that Roe versus Wade and Casey Planned Parenthood were correctly decided and they should be upheld under the principle of stare decisis. As we know, on June 24th, the Supreme Court disagreed with your argument, held that the Constitution does not confer a right to an abortion, and returned the authority to regulate abortion to the states. Ms. Rickleman, let me ask you a two-part question. You've spent half of your career as an advocate, protecting access to reproductive rights for all Americans at the Center for Reproductive Rights but now you have been nominated to set aside your advocacy and serve as a federal judge. First, how do you understand the difference between serving as an advocate and serving as a judge? Thank you so much, Senator, for the chance to address that question. As I mentioned, my parents came here because of this country's commitment to the rule of law, and I became an attorney because I believe deeply in our legal system. I've been part of that legal system for 25 years now, first as a law clerk and then as an advocate, and so I understand very well the different roles of an advocate and a judge. An advocate presents the best possible arguments on behalf of their clients, and a judge looks at all of the advocate's arguments with an open mind. Throughout my career, I have relied on federal judges around the country to follow the law regardless of their personal views or their previous work experiences. That is the kind of judge I wanted for every single one of my clients, and that is the kind of judge that I would commit to be. Second, while I disagree with the Supreme Court's decision, Dobbs is the law of the land at this moment. So let me ask you, will you apply Dobbs faithfully if you are confirmed to the First Circuit? Yes, Senator, absolutely. I want to be clear that I will apply Dobbs faithfully. Again, I've relied on federal judges, including circuit court judges, to follow Supreme Court precedent in every single case that comes before them. Our legal system and the rule of law itself depends on lower federal courts following Supreme Court precedent. And as you said, Dobbs is now the law of the land, and I will follow it as I will follow all Supreme Court precedent. Thank you. Justice Kahn, while you were serving as an assistant U.S. attorney on the District of Connecticut, you prosecuted health care fraud and other white collar crime. I want to ask you about a specific case regarding a Ponzi scheme for which you were the lead investigator and prosecutor. In the United States versus Linchak, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, a former New York University student scammed NYU into luring sophisticated investors into a fraudulent hedge fund they called Daedalus Fund, defrauding them of approximately $11.5 million defendant ultimately pleaded guilty. Tell us about your approach to the investigation and prosecution of that case. Thank you, Chairman uh, Durbin. That was a fascinating case uh, because um, it was the primary defendant was a 21-year-old um, NYU student who was uh, probably one of the smartest uh, defendants that I uh, ever prosecuted or, or uh, or defended as a public defender, he created a fake investment company and was able to convince the most sophisticated business investors to invest in it. The case started with the use of credit card machines to generate seed money for the investment. And it was uh, highly complex, uh, partly because the scheme was ongoing and we were approaching investors who had invested a lot of money in this scheme. Um, the scheme also involved um, the defendant uh, pretending to be uh, Turkish royalty and to pledging large amounts of money to NYU. Uh, so we were investigating uh, the following the money or the trail of money to prove the case. Um, 
So how did how would you uh, reflect on the celebrity of the case, the youth and press attention, and then the responsibility of the judge to uh, work in that environment and still seek justice? It's um, it's difficult when you're working on a high profile case. Um, and that one certainly was. Um, it was particularly high profile because the university had um, begun construction of a major center uh, in the name of, this, uh, of the defendant, Hakan Yelinchek, and um, had not received the funds. And then when we um, arrested uh, Hakan Yelinchek and uh, others uh, in connection with that Ponzi scheme, uh, it drew a lot of attention, particularly in New York City, around this issue. Um, and it, it is, it can be challenging uh, to prosecute a case uh, in, that gets so much attention in the media, but the focus has always been, for me, on the facts of the case, the law to be applied. Thank you.